Greetings out there on YouTube land and welcome to today's video. Uh, we haven't uh, posted any videos in a long while so I thought I'd try and make this one extra special. What you see before you uh, is an amplifier that was featured in a video several months ago. At that time uh, we said that it was a 1967 Marshall JMP50 uh, with a circuit model number 1987 and that it was a plexi lead amp. As we noted at that time it was in beautiful shape uh, other than the complete replacement of all the capacitors in the circuit. I'll pause here for a minute to show a screenshot from that video uh, of the uh, circuit uh, to refresh your memory. Lots of people commented how much better it would be if it had its original mustard caps. So the owner of the amp tracked down a full set of these caps, uh, NOS, uh, right back from the mid-60s, uh, and uh, had them sent uh, here from Amsterdam, Holland. I'll show you the cap set uh, when we go out into the workshop. My initial plan was to do an audio test with the uh, replacement caps that are in it now and then to go in and uh, install the full set of mustard caps and do a second audio demo to see if the installation of those mustard caps really made an audible difference. Once I got started uh, working on the circuit itself though uh, I discovered that this is not a 1987 circuit. This is a 1986 base amp circuit which is the same uh, as the other Marshall amp that I tested shortly after this one and compared to it. Not only that, but the set of NOS mustard caps was for a 1987 uh, circuit and therefore was not appropriate for this one. Uh, I contemplated suicide uh, and had great disappointment over the failure of my concept uh, to come to fruition. But then it occurred to me, and after a discussion with the owner, who was shocked to find out that he owned two 1986 uh, Marshalls instead of one of each type, um, we decided why not make this kind of a double switch, okay? And that is, let's convert this 1986 into a 1987 lead amp using that full set of mustard caps. Not only will I show you step by step uh, as we go through the two schematics exactly how this is done and you'll see the new mustard caps be installed in the circuit but also we'll do a before and after audio test so that you will not only hear it as it is as a 1986 with replacement caps but also as a 1987 lead circuit with NOS mustard caps. Meanwhile, as if I didn't have enough distractions, I've got this loudly purring little ex-ferro cat here that's demanding all sorts of neck rubs. So let me just stop for a second to try to calm her down. You all recognize Casey, fat and sassy. Is that okay, Casey? Can I continue with the video now? Well, okay. If that sounds at all interesting, then please stay tuned. Step one will be an audio test of the 1986 circuit with all those modern nonpolar caps installed. Then uh, I will we'll go out in the workshop where we will change the 1986 circuit into the 1987 circuit by installing that fresh set of uh, NOS mustard caps. The final stage will be where we come back in and have Ollie and Jack play the exact same tunes through the amplifier at the same settings and you will then be able to tell at home whether you notice much difference 
between the 1986 circuit with modern caps and the 1987 circuit with NOS mustard caps. Okay, now it's time for audio test number one. And as you can see, this will be of the 1986 base amp circuit with modern capacitors. We'll have Jack and Ollie play, uh, say, six, five or six songs uh, with the amp in this configuration. I'll also show you the way all the knobs are adjusted. Then uh, we will do the conversion to 1987 and then repeat this process uh, with a different label, of course, uh, stating that it is the 1987 circuit so that uh, there can be no confusion. And to facilitate a really good comparison between the uh, 1986 and 87 circuit, I'm going to save this audio demo till the latter part of the video and then I'm going to intersperse the tune with the 1986 circuit and then immediately after will be the 1987 circuit tune and we'll do that for all five or six tunes so that you'll be able to make a really quick on the spot direct comparison. So although we're going to start now on audio test one the next scene you're going to see is going to be out in the workshop uh, where we will begin the conversion between 1986 and 1987 circuits. A few months ago I showed you a bunch of my wife's paintings uh, and somehow this one didn't get included in that group so I thought I'd show it to you now. Uh, it's uh, cactus flowers which we see a lot of around here in the southwest uh, and I think it's probably her best uh, so I thought you'd get a kick out of it. As you can see we're in the throes of a deadly winter storm here uh, we've got a little sprinkling rain. I think the temperature is plunged way down to the high 40s. So we're trying to survive this. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time in the workshop uh, and the hot rods are spending a lot of time under tarps, unfortunately. The 34 Ford, however, is nice and warm and cozy here in the workshop with me. So let's get started on our new project. Okay, we've weathered the storm and the amplifier is now happily nestled out here in the workshop. Uh, and remember in the previous video we went through all the details of its design and structure. So uh, now let's just uh, focus on removing the chassis and getting started on our conversion. Okay, we got it turned around here. Uh, the four screws are out of the back. and. There is the chassis. Uh, now let's remove the four screws that are holding it in place. Okay, the chassis has been extracted and that uh, pair of West German uh, EL34s have been removed. Remember they're so tall that they protrude up here above the uh, transformers and could be damaged when I turn the chassis over so we're going to protect them by removing them and putting them down on the floor where I can accidentally step on them. No, I'm just kidding. And here we have the inverted uh, chassis exposing the circuit and you can see here those uh, fairly recently installed uh, modern nonpolar caps that have been uh, inserted into the circuit. This will be the uh, ones that we're going to replace with mustard caps. Uh, in the process of converting this from the 1986 to the 1987 circuit uh, design. And here is that full set of NOS mustard caps uh, that is appropriate for the 1987 model uh, lead Marshall amp. Uh, the owner of the amplifier tracked down this set in Amsterdam, Holland and ordered them. They arrived in this really clever little two-piece cardboard kind of booklet with inlets cut to suit the uh, size and shape of the caps so they could be sent safely through the mail. Hopefully all the right values are here and these caps will all be fully functional. I'll test them before I install them. And uh, this uh, set of Mustard caps then will allow us to convert this uh, actually misrepresented 1986 base amp circuit 
into what it was supposed to be in the first place, which was a 1987 lead amp circuit. It's my intention to uh, show you step by step how that conversion is going to be made using the 1986 schematic that suits this circuit and a 1987 uh, schematic which uh, is the lead amp schematic that this will be turned into. Now I know that some purists uh, may resent a conversion like this and so to address their concerns uh, let me make just a couple points here before we get started. Number one, when the owner bought this particular 1986 uh, base amp it was uh, represented as being the 1987 lead amp. Now he already had a absolutely mint original 1986 base amp and certainly didn't need another one. So in effect I'm simply giving him what he thought he was buying in the first place. Second, this 1986 uh, base amp is in no way a pristine original amp. The pristine originality of this one is long gone. Uh, okay, the moment an amp tech went in here and replaced every capacitor in the circuit. And point number three, which I think really is the most important, and that is that the changes I am making are strictly superficial. They are no more invasive than the original uh, changing of all those mustard caps uh, for a more modern caps. Uh, all of that was done previously by another amp tech. So it isn't that we're altering this in a irreversible way. I'm simply turning it into the amplifier the owner originally wanted and I'm doing it in such a way that it can be easily turned back into a 1986 base amp without any trace of my modifications. Hopefully that will put your objections uh, to rest and we can continue then with this project and with an open mind. So let's start off comparing schematics. Input circuit is going to be the same. Uh, the first difference that we see is on V1, a 12AX7. We see that in the 1986 circuit the uh, two cathodes uh, in V1 are uh, combined together and uh, are uh, biased with an 820 ohm bias resistor and bypassed with a 320 microfarad bypass cap. Whereas on the 1987 circuit this is V1A, this is V1B, we see that the cathodes are not connected together. Each one has its own bias resistor and bypass cap. Okay, you see that? So that's the first thing that we're going to change from this to this. And how will we begin? Well, let's look right in here at the 820 ohm bias resistor and the 320 microfarad bypass cap. They are connected here to the this is the cathode of V1, you notice it's pin 3 and they put a jumper over here to pin 8. This is the 1986 version where the two cathodes are connected together as we see them here and both uh, re are will employ the same bias resistor and uh, bypass cap. So what we will do is remove the jumper and then install the proper um, bias resistor and bypass cap, if any, to this uh, second cathode. Alright, here is the cathode of uh, V1B and I ran the wire down underneath, brought it up here, insulated so that it couldn't uh, short out with either of these terminals. And here is the 0 0.68 microfarad bypass cap and 2700 ohm bias resistor to ground right here. So it's sort of backwards. Instead of coming here 
threw into ground. I came underneath and ground up here. Now I'm telling you, uh, this is not easy because uh, when I replace the capacitors, there's really no problem. They just fit in the place that the uh, other one was. But when you're adding capacitors that were not on this board, you have to kind of clear out space and try to make it look fairly nice with the capacitor centered here, the leads um, perpendicular, uh, and as you can see, I've sort of violated some of the rules, but I'm trying my best to keep it. Now, let's go to our next step. Uh, we see that the plate coupling caps for V1A and B, that's pin 1 and pin 6, are both 0.022 microfarads, and that's the way they are in this circuit. But when we look at our 1987 circuit, we see that V1A is indeed 0.022 microfarads, but the coupling cap for V1B is 0.0022. 22 microfarads. So I'll come over here and I've already replaced the coupling cap for V1A. V1B is the wrong value. It's 0 0.022 like it was for the 1986 uh, circuit. So let's change this to 0 0.0022. Okay, the 0 0.022 is out and here is the 0 0.0022. I notice uh, some of these capacitors appear to be NOS. I see no uh, bends or solder on the leads. But then some of them, like this, have some solder. And it makes me think maybe they're pulls, um, which makes it uh, even more imperative for me to test each one of them to be sure that the value is correct. Okay, I think the majority of them are NOS, but not all of them. So now both the coupling caps have been uh, changed, 0 0.022 for V1A, 0 0.0022 for V1B. Okay, let's move down here to these uh, two 0 0.022 uh, microfarad caps, and they are connected over here to the tone controls. And when we look at the schematic, we see it's 0 0.022, 0 0.022, and it's the same on the 1987. So uh, all I'll do then is exchange mustard uh, caps for these modern caps. Well the two uh, mustard uh, tone caps are installed, 0.022's, and here's a third 0.022 here. It comes uh, over to the wiper of the treble control. Now when we come down here we see that from our treble control, uh, we do indeed have a 0.022 microfarad cap on both schematics. So all I'll have to do is exchange this modern capacitor uh, for a mustard cap of the same value. As I said, I'm double checking the capacitance of each of these uh, mustard caps and as you can see it's 0.022 it's a 0, 0.0 before this, so it's 0 0.023. That's close enough for government work. So let's install this one then to that uh, wiper of the treble tone control. Now let's look at the uh, cathode biasing here of V2, A, and B. The cathodes are biased separately. One is 820 and the other one is 100K. We come over here and we can see that this is uh, from one of the cathodes, uh, BV2A, and we see our 820. And then uh, V2B comes over here, and here's the 100K uh, bias resistor to ground. But when we look at the 1987 schematic, we see that V2B is the same uh, in both circuits. It's simply a 100K resistor to ground, and you see it right here. This is grounded. Okay, but V2A, which has the same 820 ohm uh, biasing resistor, it is cathode bypassed by a 0 0.68 microfarad cap. Uh, so we'll have to add our big fat 0.68 microfarad cap bypassing our 820 ohm bias resistor. Hopefully there'll be room for it in here. 
Well, I made some room for the 0 0.68 microfarad cap by stacking the resistors. I got a couple different resistors, 100K and 680, and uh, swung them around a little bit to the side, stacked them up, and then got plenty of room to center and have the 0.68 microfarad mustard fat cell here uh, fit in flush against the board. Okay, so now let's uh, take a look down here at these big uh, 0 0.1 microfarad caps. Okay, we can see that there's one, two, three, four of these big uh, rascals here, a 0 0.1 microfarad. And if we look over here at the schematic for the 1986 circuit, we see that one of them is for the presence control. That's the one down here on the right. Uh, two of them are coupling caps to the output tubes and uh, one of them is part of the long tail pair. Uh, so let's look now at the 1987 schematic and see if they're the same or different. Well, two of them appear to be the same. Uh, the presence control is 0 0.1 and the long tail pair uh, capacitor down here to the lower grid is 0 0.1. The difference being here that the coupling caps for the output tubes are 0.022 each. So uh, these two then will have to be replaced with 0.022 microfarad mustards and these two uh, will be replaced with 0 0.1 microfarad mustard caps. Before I uh, change out these coupling caps I wanted to say that I think that these two right here, the, uh, cutting the coupling cap down from 0 0.1 all the way down to 0 0.022 is going to really change the tone of the amp. If you have 0.1s here, they're fairly generous. They'll allow bass frequencies to get through here for your output and give you kind of a warmer, mellower, bassier type sound, which I guess would be appropriate for a bass amp. 0.022s here or actually rather low values and are going to tend to favor treble frequencies. So this is going to give you uh, a greatly increased clarity, um, probably um, an emphasis on treble tones. Now I don't know if that's what the owner is going to like or not. We'll have to test the amp and see. But uh, as it is, I'm going to uh, put in the .022s and in the audio comparison we'll see. Uh, if the uh, sound is noticeably more uh, treble intensive. All right, the 0 0.1 microfarad uh, long tail pair cap is in place and the presence cap is in place. Now let's change out uh, these two coupling caps for the output tubes. And there, last and certainly not least, are the 0 0.022 microfarad coupling caps. So the conversion to a 1987 circuit is complete. Uh, I'll have to do some testing, check the bias again and all. But then uh, I think we're ready to take this amp inside and uh, do some audio comparisons with it uh, in its previous form, the 1986 circuit. Okay, so uh, I'm going to button it all up and I'll see you inside. Now a brief footnote before we get started. Uh, some eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed that there's a couple other discrepancies with regard to very, very low value caps that exist in the circuit. We see that on the 1986 circuit we have a 500 picofarad cap here. Whereas over here on the 1987 circuit there is no 500 picofarad cap. So what I will do is just unsolder one end of that cap so that it's not making contact. I'll leave it in place if anyone ever wants to reverse the, this conversion, but I will insulate the tip so it's not making contact. Secondly, up here on the tone controls, we see that um, the 1986 has a 250 picofarad cap. Uh, for the trouble control, whereas the 87 circuit's 500 picofarads. So uh, here it is right here, and what I'll do is just put another 250 picofarad cap in parallel to this one. Okay, and I think that will complete our conversion. All the other resistor values, cap values, everything seemed to be the same now on both circuits. Well, the amp is back in the house, all buttoned up, and it's time for stage three 
of our video extravaganza. Now, as previously described, we're going to have a direct A-B comparison between some tunes that uh, are played on the 1986 circuit and then on the 1987 circuit. And because cost is absolutely irrelevant in such a video production as this, I've commissioned one of the world's best graphic artists to prepare some uh, labels to facilitate your identification of the amp that you're hearing. When it's the 1986 circuit with the uh, bright yellow replacement caps, you will see this tag. And when it's the 1987 circuit with the mustard caps, this is the tag you'll see. Also know that I will probably auction these uh, tags off on eBay later, uh, hopefully to get enough money to pay off my house. The settings will be identical for both audio demos, and uh, as you see, the uh, two channels are jumpered. Volume will be at four for both channels. Treble at six, mid-range at five, bass at six, and presence at four. We'll be using the trusty uh, M57 Shure microphone aimed at one of the two 12-inch speakers. The position will be identical in both demos. The guitar we'll be using uh, will be a 1958 Gibson Les Paul Jr. with the, a single P90 pickup. As you can see, at one time it was converted to a different tailpiece, but now it's back to the wraparound bridge. So that's our setup for the AB Audio Demos. Uh, let's plug in, get Ollie and Jack uh, sobered up from their catnip binge, and let's play some tunes.
that's about it for today's video extravaganza. I hope that you heard uh, some differences in tone. Uh, here in person, it seemed to me like, as predicted, the 1987 circuit with those smaller coupling caps on the output tubes uh, had a greater clarity. Um, it would probably be more suitable as a lead amp, so it could really cut through uh, the drummer and uh, bass mix and make itself be heard. As usual, I want to thank my PayPal and Patreon contributors for their continued support of our channel. Without them, I seriously doubt that we'd still be on the air. So thanks, guys, from all of us. And now it's time to introduce our traditional uh, second feature. Now, as you well know, I've been off the air for almost a couple months here, and I wanted to give you an idea of what I was up to during that time. It involved the conversion of the 1934 chopped and channel coupe from a four-barrel carburetor to three two-barrel Stromberg 97s. It was actually a much bigger project than I expected, and it is all detailed in the part one video that will follow. So if this sounds interesting, please stay tuned. Uh, whether or not it does, I just wanted to thank you all for watching and say that it's really good to be back. Well, greetings and welcome to today's uh, Hot Rod Extravaganza in which we're going to do the unthinkable, which is to convert the 350 Chevy engine in that chopped and channeled uh, 1934 coupe that you saw in a previous video uh, from a single uh, Edelbrock four barrel and air scoop and HEI ignition into three two barrel carburetors each with their own little helmet air cleaner and a uh, replica old-fashioned distributor made by Pertronics. It's going to look just like the old original point distributor even with a little window to lift to uh, set the dwell but it's going to be an electronic distributor. I already have the parts on hand uh, and I'm going to do this in two separate steps. The first step is I'm going to replace the HEI distributor uh, with the Pertronics replacement, get it timed, get all the, the cables, uh, the coil, everything connected properly, get it running perfectly, then I'm going to convert over to the 3-2 carburetors. That way if anything acts up with them, I'll know it's not the distributor ignition system, it's the carburetors themselves. Uh, let's go on inside let me show you what the 3-2's look like with the adapter manifold. I think you'll get a kick out of it. I've kind of set all the parts together here on display so that while I eat dinner at the table right beside this uh, cabinet I can drool over the carburetors. These are three Stromberg 97's uh, with their little helmet air cleaners and then a, a vintage speed uh, three into four barrel adapter intake manifold. As you can see it's going to look pretty slick. All right I removed the distributor cap uh, and in an HEI ignition it also includes the coil that sits up here uh, on top of the distributor and I have carefully marked the position of the base of the distributor by looking at where the vacuum advance tube is pointing and I've also marked over here where the rotor is pointing. Okay so uh, next step is to remove the bolt and crow foot down here that holds the distributor in place and keeps it from either lifting or rotating and now it's time to lift it up and out of the engine. And the distributor has been lifted out and then you see it here. The reason it has to be replaced is not only cosmetic because this is a very modern style of distributor and it had that bright red cap and red wires which are kind of jarring but also uh, when that 3-2 manifold goes on it's going to reach back here far enough that the large diameter of this distributor would interfere with it uh, being able to set properly on that intake manifold. Now here's the brand new Pertronics 
uh, old-fashioned looking distributor. You see it has the old small diameter black top and it even has the little uh, trap door here so that you would go in with your Allen wrench to set dwell although there are no points in this at all. Uh, it is uh, a, a magnetic triggering distributor. Also there is no built-in coil up here in the top of the cap like there is in the HEI system so I'm going to have to have a separate coil. But anyway let's pull the cap and then we'll make sure that the base uh, of the distributor goes in exactly like the HEI in the right direction aiming like right about there and we'll also have to be sure that the rotor is pointing over here uh, when the distributor is properly seated in the engine. Here we have the Pertronics distributor with the cap off. You see that the rotor is conventional, just typical of Chevrolet V8s, but uh, there are no points or condenser in this. We have a magnetic trigger uh, to initiate the spark. Now looking way down in that uh, little black well there at the rear of the engine, you can see a slotted uh, steel rod. Well, that's what drives the oil pump. And as you can see, the slot now is sort of parallel to the firewall of the car. Yet on the distributor, for it to fit in properly, uh, that slot needs to be perpendicular to the uh, firewall of the car. So I'm going to have to reach in there with a long screwdriver and adjust the oil pump slot in its drive rod uh, to where it, it's in the proper position uh, for the distributor gear to fully mesh and set down in the engine. You can see the, the drive there for the uh, oil pump. Uh, looks like the end of a big fat screwdriver nestled down in the bottom of the gear. And now I hope you can see down in here that the slot is facing uh, perpendicular to the firewall. Maybe you can't see it, but trust me it is. Okay, the new distributor is uh, dropped into place. You see that the vacuum advance uh, snout is pointing right here at the original mark and the rotor is pointing over here. So it's not in perfect time. We're going to have to adjust the base in relation to the position of the rotor to um, adjust the timing to get it just right. But what you want is close enough for the car to start and idle. And I think this is close enough. Okay, so let's go ahead and put on the cap. We'll install the coil and the plug wires. Uh, and then I think we'll be ready to uh, check it, see if the car will run, and set the timing. Now just to make sure that all the ignition parts work together well, I got a Pertronix flamethrower coil to go along with that distributor. And I have mounted a uh, chrome coil bracket up here on the firewall. It's there for two reasons. Number one is you can't mount it up here because that would interfere with the 3-2 manifold. And when it's mounted on the firewall, it, it, the coil stays a lot cooler, which is better. So for two reasons, I have mounted the, the chrome uh, coil clamp up here on the firewall. Let's install the coil and then wire it up uh, and put the cap on and the spark plug wires. Distributor cap on, the coil is wired with the switch hot wire from the ignition and uh, the black, black and red wires over here uh, to the uh, distributor. Now uh, it's time to install the spark plug wires. Well, step one is finished. The a new distributor and coil have been installed with a brand new uh, set of spark plug wires. Uh, the ignition timing has been set. So now it's time to move on to the removal of the air scoop and the four barrel carburetor and then we can test fit that 3-2 uh, adapter manifold. Okay the scoop and air cleaner have been removed and now it's time to disconnect all the hoses, linkage and everything else and remove the uh, Edelbrock four barrel carburetor. Okay everything has been removed from the carburetor and including the four half inch nuts that hold it to the manifold so it's time to lift it off uh, and then we can go get that 3-2 um, adapter manifold and test fit it.
And while I'm at it, I gotta say that this black Pertronics distributor and coil looks so much better than that giant bright red HEI distributor. Uh, I should have installed this a long time ago. And here's the 3-2 manifold uh, installed. And as you can see, there's very little clearance back here between it and even this small distributor cap. So there's no way this thing could have fit with that giant HEI distributor. Um, so there it is. It does fit. I was worried about it interfering up here, but no. It sits down nice and flat. So I guess now uh, it's time to machine the manifold uh, for vacuum lines, for the vacuum modulator to help the transmission shift, for vacuum advance, for the distributor, uh, and then uh, install it and then start installing the carburetors and linkage. Mm -hmm.